The culinary tradition of a region is largely influenced by its geographical environs. In the Philippines, a country known for its extensive coastlines and seas playing host to impressive biodiversity, much has been said about seafood. But what about mountain food? For one, the province of Ifugao, in the Cordilleras of northern Philippines, has an entirely different menu compared to the fish and seashell fare of Filipinos dwelling alongside beaches or lakeshores. In what seems like a simple task of cooking everyday meals, the hardy people living in these altitudes contend with factors such as very cold temperatures, thinner air pressure, and the scant availability of ingredients which are not locally produced in the highlands. In the days when Ifugao was inaccessible, salt, a product of seaside communities, was a luxury afforded only by the wealthy traded with the people of the Ilocos coast, west of the Cordillera ranges. Back then, the common mountain folk endured a life without salt, which meant that the only hint of flavors came from their native ginger root and onion. Today, salt is easily transported into the markets of Ifugao, and a host of other foreign flavors and dishes have been introduced since to the otherwise simplistic native palate. One of the more peculiar edibles that find its origin from outside Ifugao is the yuyu, or dojo, a fish introduced by the Japanese in the Second World War. The healthily irrigated rice terraces became the breeding pens for these finger-sized fish. One Ifugao recipe which uses yuyu is the inlet. The inlet is especially popular in the town of Mayoyao, where yuyu is known as pikao. In cooking inelet, the fish is boiled in brine until the water dries up, producing a sharp, salty dish best served with a generous heaping of highland rice. The Ifugao takes pride in producing organic rice, grown in their centuries-old rice terraces, coming in variants of red or white. The grains of mountain rice are bigger and rounder. As such, it needs more water for the grains to puff up. Knowingly, an Ifugao cook would steer the rice pot as it steams. In the mountains, the diminished air pressure slows down the cooking process such that water needs more heat in order to boil, while the bottom part of the pot, which hugs the fire, sufficiently cooks the rice, the upper part would take longer time to heat up. The rice would then end up either half-cooked on the surface or burnt black at the bottom. To let the heat circulate evenly, steering is required. Another method of cooking, this time using native fowl eggs, is the intokto. The eggs are poached for a few moments in boiling water. Salt is added, and then the whole batch is scrambled to distribute the flavor evenly. Onion leaves are spooned in for texture. In Ifugao, most of the truly indigenous dishes are either boiled or smoked. In the days before the invention of refrigerators, smoking was a way of preserving meat. A Mayoyao cook explains the process. We're smoking the meat. This is one way of our preserving meat and also it gives more taste to the meat. This process takes a long time. After smoking, we boil it. This is boiled with water and salt only. We don't add anything. So you can see the color that is the natural oil in it. We don't put any oil. 
Even their vegetable dishes are boiled plain. Frying and sautéing is a fairly recent concept to them, since they do not grow crops that are known sources of oil such as corn, coconut, or palm. Desserts were once unheard of. The traditional ifugao, after eating, chews the moma or buyo, which is just as fine or even better because moma keeps the chewer warm in the chilly mountains. Throughout Asia, the culture of chewing the areca nut, the betel leaf, and lime powder is prevalent. The uh, purpose of this is uh, a way of uh, socialization. Uh, see, uh, when people meet, and uh, also with young men and women, they usually ask uh, each other uh, uh, if they have betel leaf or betel nut, so to begin a conversation. And uh, afterwards, uh, they chew it to make themselves uh, warm. And uh, usually, chew it, they usually chew it also uh, after meals or to add in the digestion. The chewing, chewing the betel nut, it's in a way that deserves the taste. Why? Yeah. Yeah, because of the lime, no, the tooth decay. Mga tartar, iniwasan yan. So it's better for us na maging pula, or it's better that our red. Our teeth are red rather than have no teeth. It's better to have breath than bad breath at all. A word of caution though for people who wish to try this practice. It is nothing like chewing gum. It feels more like trying to crush wood chunks between your teeth. So it is not uncommon to see toothless Ifugao elders grinding their moma inside metal tubes before sliding it into their mouths. Mumai is chewed to increase body temperature in these chilly mountain regions. For the first timer, it could be a dizzying experience. Blood shoots up your head as your heart palpitates and your face heats up. Not recommended for people with high blood pressure. While chewing, a little lime is added every now and then. It is not advisable to put the lime directly in one's tongue. This causes a painful burning sensation. Instead, the lime should be wiped on the tip of any molar to let the powder sit and then slowly thin out inside the mouth. Of course, you don't swallow the whole thing. Another favorite way of keeping warm is through the jolly consumption of a little alcohol in the ever-present rice wine. In Ifugao, rice wine is known as baya and it is an important part of celebrations and rituals of spiritual importance. The color of the baya may it be red, yellow or white depends on the type of rice used. The fermenting agent used is homemade yeast, hardened dough made of pounded rice, hot chili as preservative, and the fire-dried leaves and roots of the onward plant. Mixed to pounded rice, grounded rice that is, uh, it is uh, being uh, powdered. And then they will have to, have to cut this one into chop it. Folklore tells us that the Ifugao started incorporating the onward plant into the dough after observing local sparrows eating its leaves and getting drunk from it. This is how an Ifugao produces several bottles of baya. So the first thing to do is to, after you have cooked already the malakit, it should be half cooked. We will put it here so it will be coolen. We have to let it be coolen first because when it is like this and you put the yeast, it will be destroyed. We will have to wait because it's very hot. The powder has to be spread out uh, evenly so that uh, the fermentation will be uniform. The weather is cool, the winemaker would apply more yeast to ensure that it will not get cold and the fermentation will be uh, normal. When it is uh, summer, they can apply uh, less, uh, amount, less amount of uh, yeast. Now we have to hit the banana leaves. Second 
they you have to bore a hole there so that that's where the juice will pass through you will smell something pleasing smell okay now it is ready to be fermented you have to put it in the somewhere in the corner you have to put it this way when you put not flat it has to be like that because on the second day the juice will start dripping that's why you have to bore a hole here so that the juice can pass through and on the third day it's ready to be placed in the jar normally the practice is uh, the uh, juice that has uh, Dip into the container here. We will place it in the jar. Before putting Course, the before the uh, fermented rice is uh, put inside. The basic skill of self-declared bayak connoisseurs is the ability to spot an undiluted batch. To know this, one has to look closely into the bottle. If the rice wine produces small bubbles rising to the surface, it shows that it is free of water and sugar extenders. And that means a stronger kick in the head. <laughs>